In this study, we're going to take a look at pediatric scoring and identify some of the similarities and differences as compared to adult scoring. Let's go on to our next slide. As far as the polysomnogram itself, the recording parameters are going to be exactly the same as adult plus the addition of end tidal CO2. Our audio-visual equipment, we want all-night video recording, ideally with a pan and tilt, as well as a zoom-in and zoom-out features. Um, this is used for any unusual activity during sleep, as well as body position, body rocking, or head banging. Your technical notes are going to be highly important, but if you can capture it on video for the physician to correlate what you wrote down and what he can actually see is, is very helpful. Um, also, audio recordings for any snoring, snorts, or sounds, sleep talking or screaming, uh, teeth grinding, and so on. Again, your technologist notes are highly important, but if that can be correlated with the audio, re audio recording, um, that just helps the physician out as uh, tremendously. Let's go on to our next slide. Your physiological calibration, you are going to go ahead and do this with your pediatrics, just like you would your adults. However, you might need to make some modifications to it. Um, you can instruct the same with the eyes open, eyes closed, um, based on your child's age, if they can follow those kinds of commands. Um, but you might have the child growl or grin in order to get the see the chin EMG. You might have the patient sing aloud to simulate counting. Um, you can ask, ask them to hold their breath, wiggle their toes. So it's kind of brought down to the child's level and made into a game for them unlike our adults where we just kind of tell them what to do when they do it. <laughs> let's go on to our next slide. Okay, let's take a look at some pediatric scoring rules. These rules should apply to any child that is two months post-term. You might see the term um, post-conception used. So in that case, this, these rules apply to any child 48 months post-conception. So an example of where this might come into play is if you have a child that's born at 36 weeks, so it was born premature, slightly premature, you wouldn't be able to apply these rules until three months after they were delivered because that would be the 48 post-conceptual time. And that's when two months post-term, that's when these rules begin. Okay, the following stages can be used to stage score um, pediatric sleep if the characteristics of each stage are present. For example, um, if spindles or K-complexes are present, then you would score it as N2. If slow wave sleep is present, then you would score it as N3. If you do not have those characteristics present as you're scoring it, if you're not seeing the spindles, you're not seeing K-complexes, you're not seeing slow wave sleep, then you're just going to score it as N, as in non-REM sleep, because you can maybe tell the difference between REM and non-REM, but you're just not seeing those specific characteristics needed for that stage of sleep. The next slide um, we're gonna take a look at provides the word-for-word -word rule that describes what I've just explained above. I think the way I say it is much easier, um, but I'll leave it up to you. So let's go to our next slide. Okay, these are the exact rules for pediatric sleep studies. If all epochs of non-REM sleep contain no recognizable sleep spindles, K-complexes, or high amplitude 0.5 to 2 hertz slow wave activity, score all epochs of non-REM as stage N. If in some epochs of non-REM sleep you see sleep spindles or K-complexes, score those as stage N2. If the remaining non-REM epochs, there is no slow wave activity comprising more than 20% of the duration of the epochs, score as stage N. If some of the epochs of non-REM sleep contain greater than 20% slow wave activity, score these as N3. If the remaining non-REM epochs, there are no K-complexes or spindles, then score as stage N. If non-REM is sufficiently developed that some epochs contain sleep spindles or K-complexes and other epochs contain sufficient amounts of slow wave activity, then score non-REM sleep in the patient as either N1, N2, N3, as in an older child or adult. So, okay, again, they made this way too hard. Basically, if you don't see uh, any characteristic activity for the different stages of sleep, then just score it as N as in non-REM sleep. Let's go to our next slide. Okay, let's talk about how we score stage wake in pediatrics. 
The definitions used in wake, stage wake is the same as adults. That's the alpha rhythm, the eye blinks, the reading eye movements, and the rapid eye movements. However, with kids, sometimes that, that EEG activity isn't fully developed yet. And so what we call that in kids is posterior dominant rhythm. They may not have those nice alpha waves yet, but they do have some sort of wave, and we call it posterior dominant rhythm. Okay, so explaining that term, posterior dominant rhythm, um, the dominant reactive EEG rhythm over the occipital regions in relaxed wakefulness with eyes closed, which is slower in infants and young children and attenuates with eye opening or attention. And you can see I have the different frequencies um, for the different age groups listed there. But again, this is, this is what their EEG looks like before they've developed the alpha activity in their EEG. Let's go on to our next slide. So in order to score stage wake, you're gonna replace the term alpha rhythm with posterior dominant rhythm. So in children, the term posterior dominant rhythm replaces the term alpha rhythm for the purposes of scoring wakefulness and non-REM stages. So we're gonna score stage W anytime we see 50% or more of that posterior dominant rhythm on an epic. If you do not have that posterior dominant rhythm, um, you're going to score stage W if any of the following are present. The eye blinks, the reading eye movements, and the irregular rapid eye movements associated with normal or high chin muscle tone. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, for stage N1, um, the terms that we use in stage N1 are again going to be the same as adults and we're going to add two more terms. That's rhythmic anterior theta activity and hypnagogic hypersynchrony. If you see either one of these, that is going to be an indication that your patient is in N1 sleep. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so how are we going to score N1 sleep or how are we going to recognize it? Well, remember, PDR is like alpha in the adults. It's the same thing. So as we see PDR being replaced by the low amplitude mixed frequency activity in more than 50% of the epic, then we're going to score it as N1. If the patient does not generate PDR, then we're going to score N1 anytime we see any of the following things listed here below. That's activity in the range of 4 to 7 hertz with slowing of background frequencies by 1 to 2 hertz, slow eye movements, vertex sharps, rhythmic anterior theta activity, hypnagogic hypersynchrony, diffuse or occipital predominant high amplitude rhythmic 3 to 5 hertz activity. So just like with adults, as we see less alpha activity, um, we see more low amplitude mixed frequency, it's going to be the same with pediatrics, only it's the PDR that's being replaced. Let's go into our next slide. Okay, so as far as kids go, all the other scoring rules are the same. Um, the N2 staging rules, N3 staging rules, and REM staging rules are all the same as for pediatrics as they are for adults. Only one thing to remember is if you don't have those special characteristics, if you don't have spindles or K-complexes, or you don't see that slow wave sleep, then you're going to score those stages as stage N, as in non-REM sleep. Because sometimes you can't tell the difference between stage N2 and N3 based on the child's age, so you would just score it as N. You can always tell REM, though, so REM would you still follow the same rules. The arousal rules uh, for scoring are the same. And then another thing to just keep in mind is the PDR, or that posterior dominant rhythm, is going to replace the term alpha in your adult scoring rules. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, newborn scoring is slightly different. Remember the scoring rules we just talked about. Those apply to patients two months old and older. But what if you have a patient younger than your two-month age? Well, then you have newborn scoring rules to follow. I don't believe much of this is going to be on the exam at all, but we should just review it just in case. Um, spindles generally start to appear at six months of age. Um, there's some high voltage bursts, low voltage mixed frequency waves with sharp transients seen during quiet sleep, and we call this trace alternant. And we're gonna show you an example here in a minute. Um, just a side note, notice there is some overlap between pediatric and newborn scoring. 
pediatric rules can be followed in those two months to one year, and newborn rules can be used um, any time during this time. They can be used up to one year old. Basically, the physician who's going to be interpreting the study is going to make that decision. Let's go on to our next slide. So here's an example of the trace alternan in EEG. Um, this is a five-minute epic, and it's actually showing periodic breathing in an 18-day-old who was born seven weeks premature. And you can see the trace alternan pattern in the EEG. It kind of repeats itself as it goes along. Let's go on to our next slide. Um, this is just a newborn scoring continued. Around 40 weeks, conceptual age is when the following can be scored. Quiet sleep and active sleep. Quiet sleep is high voltage EEG and EOG activity, typically greater than 75 microvolts. The EMG may remain ton tonic. Active is EEG will show low voltage mixed frequency activity, your EOG may show some phasic activity, and your EMG may not necessarily be diminished due to activities such as sucking, cooing, gurgling, etc. So the chin is extremely active during this stage of sleep. Then there is indeterminate, and this is scored when the sleep stage criteria cannot be classified or differentiated between your quiet and active sleep. So for newborns, you can score it as quiet, active, or indeterminate. Let's go on to our next slide. Um, sleep disruption for the newborns. Uh, periodicity of active sleep is approximately every 50 to 60 minutes after sleep onset. Um, sleep onset, active sleep is common until about three months of age. Let's go on to our next slide. Um, this is just a quick reference for you to show which waveforms appear at different age groups. For example, you should see sleep spindles around two weeks to three months post-term. Slow wave activity, you should see two to five months post-term. And K-complexes, you should see three to six months post-term. Let's go on to our next slide. Um, for our apnea, our monitoring equipment that we're going to use is going to be the same as adults. However, we also need to include our end tidal CO2. This is acceptable for identifying apnea when the oronasal thermal airflow is not available. For obstructive sleep apnea, notice your rule is a little bit different. We have absence of airflow, which would be a 90% fall in amplitude of the signal for at least 90% of the event. Um, but this absence of airflow is going to occur for two baseline breaths or longer in duration while respiratory effort continues. So you have to get an idea of their respiratory pattern and watch for the absence of two baseline breaths, um, and that would be an obstructive apnea. It's not the 10 second rule because pediatrics breathe faster than us, and for each age group, the respiratory rate is going to change. So that's why we base it on their baseline breaths. So for a central apnea, again, it's gonna be for two breaths, um, an absence, two breaths or more with an associated arousal, uh, awakening or a greater than 3% desaturation, but this is also going to lack inspiratory effort. So there's gonna be absence of airflow and inspiratory effort for two breaths or more. Um, central apneas can also be scored if the event lasts for greater than 20 seconds. Um, you can also score to mixed apneas in pediatrics, and this is where there's an absence of airflow for two baseline breaths or longer with no respiratory effort in the first part of the event, but with returned respiratory effort in the last part of the event. Let's go on to our next slide. Non-apneic events, hypopneas are detected using nasal air pressure transducers. Unless it is unreliable, then you are going to use your oronasal thermal sensor. It's going to be scored when there is a 50% or greater reduction in the waveform for 90% or greater of the duration of the event. The event must last for two breath cycles or longer and be associated with an arousal, awakening, or 3% or greater desaturation. Um, Rereads, we typically don't score them in children because they are so difficult and just not very reliable. Um, but if you are going to score them, you must score them using a nasal pressure transducer or an esophageal pressure sensor. You're going to score it when there's less than 50% decrease in the amplitude of the nasal pressure waveform when compared to baseline, accompanied by a flattening of the wave or progressive increase in inspiratory effort on the esophageal pressure sensor. It must last two breath cycles or more. 
snoring, noisy breathing, elevation in the end tidal or transcutaneous CO2, or increased work of breathing must accompany the event. So you can see that's pretty hard to score. So let's go on to our next slide. Here is a pediatric polysomnogram that shows our non-arousal respiratory event here. Um, you see your SpO2, you see your nasal pressure transducer, your end tidal CO2, followed by your airflow, and then your thoracic effort, followed by our abdominal effort. And all of your respiratory uh, monitoring channels, you do see a significant decrease for more than two breath cycles. Um, however, we do not see an arousal. We also don't see our end tidal CO2 rise um, significantly, actually, at all. Um, so this is actually a non-scorable event. Let's go on to our, our next slide. Um, hypoventilation is seen more often in our pediatric patients, especially those with the neuromuscular weaknesses and other congenital disorders. Um, if our end tidal or transcutaneous PCO2 indicates a CO2 level of greater than 50 for more than 25% of the total sleep time, then we're going to score it as sleep-related hypoventilation. Let's go on to our next slide. Um, here's an example of our hypoventilation. You again see your SpO2 um, line, and that's fluctuating pretty significantly. Then you have your nasal pressure waveform, followed by your end tidal, and then your airflow, your thoracic effort, and your abdominal effort. Notice your end tidal CO2 readings are consistently at 64, 65, um, and so on. So that is above 50. And so if that went on for 25% or more of your study, then you would diagnose this as, or score it as um, sleep-related hypoventilation in the pediatric. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so some more pediatric respiratory events that are scorable is periodic breathing. Um, short central apneas are fairly common in children, especially during REM sleep, and usually there's no serious physiological concern, um, but sometimes this needs to be scored as periodic breathing and identified clearly. Periodic breathing is scored when there are three or more central apneas lasting greater than three seconds in duration, separated by no more than 20 seconds of normal breathing between each apnea. Our next slide, we're going to take a look at a, an example of periodic breathing. So let's go to that. Okay, so here um, we have a full-term infant at four weeks of age. Uh, you see your SpO2 monitoring line, your nasal pressure transducer, your end tidal CO2, your airflow signal, your thoracic effort, and your abdominal effort. Now, clearly in your airflow thoracic effort and abdominal effort channels, you can see about one, two, three, four, five good breaths followed by an apneic period, and then another five or so breaths followed by another central apneic period, and this repeats on down the line. This would be an example of something you would score as a periodic breathing in the full-term infant. Uh, notice your SpO2 doesn't change that much um, along with that. Let's go on to our next slide. Here's a five-minute epic showing periodic breathing in an 18-day-old who was born seven weeks premature. Um, and this is, this is the same slide we actually looked at with the trace alternan, but this would actually be diagnosed as periodic or scored as periodic breathing. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, so we've covered our stage scoring, we've covered our respiratory scoring. Now let's take a look at our cardiac scoring. Dysrhythmias in children are more similar to adults, however, they occur much less often. Premature ventricle contractions, or PVCs, which occur in a series or have more than one focus, need the attention from a physician. So make sure if you see that, you note it um, and include it in your documentation. SVT, or supraventricular tachycardia, is more common in kids. They can produce a heart rate greater than 220 beats per minute. Most of these episodes only last a few seconds, but prolonged or frequent episodes need intervention. So again, if you see this on your polysomnogram, make sure you document it so the, so the physician can address it. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, again, um, just like with adults, we are going to document if we see bradycardia or tachycardia. However, our measurement um, criteria is going to change. For bradycardia, if they're newborn to one month old, we call bradycardia anytime their heart rate goes below 80. 
For those one to two months old, we call bradycardia anything under 70, and for those older than two months, it's going to be anything less than 60. For tachycardia, it is slightly different there as well. For newborns, anything greater than 190 is considered tachycardic, and for infants, anything greater than 160 is considered tachycardic. Um, commonly, you'll see tachycardia in REM or following a respiratory event. So tachycardia is much more common to see than bradycardia in your kids. Let's go on to our next slide. Okay, lastly, let's talk a little bit about artifact and our documentation. Um, artifacts are actually quite frequent in our pediatric study. We have two causes, patient causes and parent causes. With patient causes, it can be due to crying, rocking, sucking, or movement. And with our parents, it could be due to them touching them, holding them, rubbing them, or feeding them. Um, the best thing you can do is prevent it by securing your uh, equipment during your hookup and getting a really good hookup. Um, if you do have artifact, you want to address it appropriately, meaning as soon as you see it, if the patient is still awake, go fix it while they're awake. But if they've just fallen asleep and it's taken them a long time to fall asleep and all of a sudden there's artifact, you might want to just wait it out um, and let that artifact go. However, be sure you document this and document why you made that decision. So for your documentation, you want to identify the source of the artifact, the action you took to fix it, or why you didn't fix it. Um, patient causes of artifact, uh, document of the eyes open or closed can be especially useful when scoring infant studies to help determine what was going on. And then with the parent causes of artifact, again, you'd want to document if they're rubbing them or feeding them or holding them, um, just document what's going on so the physician interpreting it can have a clear picture of what that night was like. This concludes this PowerPoint. <laughs>